Hello and welcome to Series 7, Episode 8 of In Suspense, a podcast and vodcast for fans and writers of crime fiction. I'm Leslie Cara and as you can see, I've got two co-hosts today, the lovely Lauren North and the equally lovely Nikki Smith, who is going to be joining us full time next year. So we thought it would be nice to have all three of us here for our Christmas special um, you can probably guess it's our Christmas special from um, if you're watching it anyway, because we've got some. Well, Nikki's got her Christmas hat on, and I've got my reindeer ears on, and Lauren's got a sparkly jumper on. Sparkly jumper. So, yeah, sorry, I feel like my effort level is a bit poor, but and most people listen, so they won't know. That's true. That is true. So, in our last episode, we talked to the incredibly wonderful um, Adele Parks, um, and the topic was career longevity and adapting to the market. And it was really brilliant. It was such an inspiring uh, discussion, wasn't it, Lauren? Yeah, it's really good. Um, we've had lots of really positive comments online. Um, so, I, I, yeah, if you haven't listened to that one yet, do tune in because, you know, Adele has written, is it 22 books in 22 years? She yeah. is phenomenal. So, you know, you can learn a lot from listening to mm. just some of her, her answers. Um, <clears throat> but today in our Christmas special, we are going to be chatting to Ruth Heald. And the topic is going to be digital, but blah, 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 busting the myths of digital publishing. Is that correct? Have I got that right? Yes, yes digital publishing, correct. busting the myths. myths. Yeah. And she'll be on in a moment. But before then, we will have our usual catch up. But there's three lots of catch ups to do today. So who should we start with? Shall we start with you, Nikki? What, what's been going okay. on in your life? Well, um, I have just finished um, the first draft of my next book, which doesn't come out until 2024. Um, so I feel a little bit ahead of the game. Um, but I wanted to finish it um, before the beach party comes out in uh, July 23. So um, this one's another destination thriller. Um, it's set in the Maldives um, this time. So um, it was lovely to write um, in amongst the kind of grey raininess that we've had here. Um, and obviously now freezing, freezing cold. Um, so yeah, that's been good. Um, I want to get it to my editor to see if she's got any kind of major structural changes that she wants done so I can get that done before the beach party comes out. Um, and then last week, um, it was it was a pretty social week, actually. Um, I ended up going to London quite a bit, um, obviously met you guys, which was fantastic. Um, and I also went up to uh, the Curtis Brown creative writing um, course. I went up and met, um, there was about 13 students I think um, with my agent Sophie Lambert um, and just went and chatted to them and just answered lots and lots and lots of questions so um, yeah it was a really lovely evening it was really nice actually lovely to see all the lights in London and things so um, yeah it was it was great how about you Lauren what have you been doing? Well, I've had a really like nice couple of weeks, actually. It's been quite calm and quiet. So I've been doing lots of reading and sort of catching up on things. Um, and I went to London and met you guys on Wednesday last week. And I went to the Penguin offices and got to record some voices for The Ugly Truth because it's got loads of different characters. They asked me to do a few. And then when I was there, they were like, oh, do a few more. So I ended up doing about five or six different voices. It was brilliant. Um, Nerve wracking and completely out of my comfort zone, but just a really special thing to do. I think we just spend so much time in our writing caves that to actually go and do something like that and to see some of the magic happen. I mean, I just find the audiobook recordings just so exciting and interesting and it's such a talent to be able to do it. So that was really good fun. And then, yes, I um, we had lunch, didn't we? And then we had a little party, which was very nice. And I did try and leave 10 minutes early because it was six to late. And I was so tired that a few people said, I'm not, I was, because I'd organised it, I wasn't allowed to leave um, but it was lovely I was home in bed by 10 30. Yeah what about you Leslie? It was it was so nice to catch up with you guys and all the all the other lovely writers that came along on Wednesday evening it was it was a really lovely lovely um, time and it was great that you organized that for us Lauren it was really yeah. really wonderful all down to you getting that yeah. um, getting that organized. Lauren is really our social secretary isn't she she's <laughs> just brilliant what would we do without she her? Is. Yeah, some work done probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, and then so I the next day after that I met my agent for lunch and had a really nice lunch with her and catch up. So that was really nice. And um, but yeah, I've just been writing really. I'm on the last. Um, I think I've got about 
12 to 15,000 words still to do. So I'm very, very close now um, and have, you know, a very clear schedule ahead of me. So I haven't really got any other commitments apart from, you know, family things that might come up, obviously. But um, yeah, so I'm just I'm getting up very early and writing in the morning writing all day actually having a bit of a break and then sometimes coming back to it in the evening oh, you must be tired I am tired I'm very tired my eyes are tired that's why I <laughs> whammed the video settings on quite high today so that yeah, you can't see quite that. how many <laughs> quite how many um, and, so are you hoping to finish before Christmas well, my fun? deadline is the 9th of Jan and I've oh, got yeah. to do it by then because I'm going in for my first eye operation on the 9th of Jan. Mm. So I am, but I am hoping to. It's, you know, I'm at that stage where, I mean, it, you know, I, I think I'm very cl close to finishing it and feel really enthusiastic still about doing it. But every so often I'm plagued with terrible doubts that it you know it's not coming together yeah. but that's normal isn't it that's yeah it. all completely I think that's normal. totally normal yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and huge like... swings even I know when I was writing my even within a day you know from you go from feeling oh this is this isn't bad this is quite good actually to oh my goodness this is the worst mm -hmm. thing ever and you know yeah it's just got to keep yourself motivated keep going keep that's going that's right and I think we talked didn't we when we met last week Nikki I think you said you've got to trust in the process and that is mm -hmm. absolutely true that is all we can do and you know it needs to be read by editors and they will sort yeah. it out if it needs yeah. sorting out. It, it will need sorting out. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, I mean, I don't know about you two as well. I go a bit feral when I'm really in my writing cave. Mm. Um, I mean, I've, I've obviously, you know, I've smartened up today because I'm we're putting this out on YouTube. And if we go out, I kind of make an effort. But I'm really slobby when I'm writing and I, I, I eat badly and I don't exercise enough because it's all consuming. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. just, yeah, I, I just feel like a, a feral creature, really. Yeah, no, I'm exactly the same. Well, it was one day last week where I was reading the notes through, I was reading my book from 2017 and making notes on it. And there was no massive rush on it, but I kind of just sat so determined at the gym. I didn't even work out. And by the end of the day, I was like, well, I've just, what have I, was this the right thing to do for me? Because I didn't exercise. I only ate junk. I got it done, but now I'm really tired. I could have spent three days doing it. Yeah. and would have been a lot happier and healthier but I just pushed myself too much so I, I, I think you agree you just get in the zone yeah I think that's the problem about being quite a kind of workaholic person isn't it I'll do that if I'm doing my book then that's it everything else goes out the window and I'm you know I'm not great at exercising at the best of times but I think that's going to have to be one of my new year resolutions is to actually make myself do things for away from the book for an hour because otherwise you just find you've just been sitting on your bottom as you say Leslie eating junk all day um and not doing anything so yes I need to pace myself I think talking of eating yeah. junk I've got some delicious biscuits here so if only you oh, could have some I would, I would oh. let you have some. <laughs> and I, that's oh, not the only one. see I, I really do eat bad I mean I'm not gonna eat all of them these beautiful lemon ones look I'm gonna oh, you can't nice. see them oh, very nice yeah that's so They're nice, nice. Oh, I got given some gorgeous chocolates from um Claire Cooper on Wednesday it was really sweet of us some hotel chocolate ones <laughs> oh, God, I oh. Oh, oh she's lovely home. isn't she there yeah, I had a nice chat with her yeah <laughs> oh right so I think it's probably about time that we got our our guest on for today isn't yes. it the fabulous Ruth Heald so yeah. welcome everybody Ruth Heald Okay, welcome Ruth Heal to In Suspense. Um, I'm going to read um, a bit about your bio, um, Ruth, just so that the listeners get to hear a bit about you. Um, so Ruth Heal is the best-selling author of six psychological thrillers. Her books have sold over 250,000 copies worldwide as eBooks, paper books, and audio books. She has always written, but before she became a full-time author, she had a career in strategy working at the BBC, the UK Atomic Energy Authority and in consulting. Her latest book, The Nanny, was published by Bookature and has over 600 reviews on Amazon. That's the last time I looked. It's probably gone more than that now. Um, and a 4.3 star rating, which is absolutely incredible. So congratulations for that. And um, Ruth, do you want to tell our listeners um, a little bit about your book, The Nanny? Yeah, sure. Um, so The Nanny's about um, Hayley who in, worked as a nanny in Thailand 20 years ago. 
Um, so, and in that time when she's working as a nanny, the baby she was looking after went missing. So she's looking after three children and the baby went missing and was never found. And now 20 years later, she's got her own happy family, her own happy life. And it all starts to be disrupted when a woman appears at her door. And this woman looks like the kind of computer generated image of how that baby would look today. Ooh. So that's the kind of central mystery. Who is this woman? Yeah, yeah that's that's a brilliant description. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely loved the book. I listened to Thank it you. on Audible um, and it's a real heart in your mouth thriller um you painted such an evocative scene of Thailand and the location it felt almost like a character in itself um and I wondered what made you decide um to base it so much of it in Thailand yeah well I've lived in Thailand um about 10 years ago just for a year and it's just so, Bangkok is so vibrant mm. it's such a good setting and it's it's kind of familiar enough to people but also different enough that you can make things uh, shake things up a little bit um and there's so many things to describe as well all the temples the heat everything's just that little bit different and also um for Haley, she's a backpacker and she doesn't have much money and being far away from home as a nanny just really adds to that vulnerability she has and that trapped feeling also the kind of labor laws aren't quite the same so the relationship she has with the people who she's nannying for they're almost abusive towards her really I mean they're very controlling mm -hmm. and I think just being abroad enables part of of the story as, as well and it, it was just really fun to write about Bangkok again and imagine I was there again <laughs> as well so that was a huge element for me. What I liked about it is that it's set in an expat community isn't it and you don't often see that in um, destination thrillers you know it's usually tourists isn't it? Um, yeah. So I, I really thought that added a, a, another sort of extra dimension, you know, seeing characters actually living in a place. Um, and I wondered, because I know that, you you know, you've got experience of living in an expat community. Was that sort of what um, inspired you to write the book? Yeah, um, I think that element of it, the... So at first, the um, inspiration was really the Louise Woodward case years ago, yeah. which I've always, yeah. always wanted to kind of write about or yeah. I've always been interested in. And there was a bit of a resurgence of interest in it recently as well. Um, so there was that, but then, it, well, you know how many elements go into a book, don't you? It, it was then like, well, where would be the most interesting place to have her? And then once I started writing the nanny scenes, it became her nanny for expats. And then I could bring that experience of bringing being an expat myself into it. And some of the interesting dimensions of that, because I think, as an expat, it's um, it's a lot of fun, but it, it's quite a thin surface sometimes yeah. that you're you're on because if you're in a country because either you have a job there or you have a partner there, it only takes that element to, to be removed, and then the security is kind of gone entirely, right? Um, so if you lose the job, then you can't live in the country. If you lose a if you're there as a partner, if you lose a partner, you can't live in the country. <laughs> Um, and certainly I knew people that kind of thing did happen to. Um, and so it's a very charmed life, but but there are a lot of things under the surface. In the book, the man in the couple, his ex-wife, basically, he got together with his new wife and then she was kind of cast aside. And she's in this very vulnerable position where she you know, has to leave, really. But her children are there. And it it's all quite complicated. And I, I think there are lots of dimensions to it. It's quite an interesting thing I mean maybe I'll write more books on that because I've got experience of it yes because yeah. it must be quite an isolating experience isn't it moving out somewhere you know unless you feel really part of that community then that could be quite quite isolating and adds to the vulnerability doesn't it of the of the character as you yeah do. it's just not having those connections that you might have at home the kind of society the friends and family the community mm. that it can be a very charmed life but it can quickly become not like that. So there's just, there's a lot of potential in that and the different kind of characters that are expats for different reasons for being expats. I mean, um, I'm, I'm not talking about anyone, I, know, I don't know anyone like this, but some people maybe will be an expat because there's something they don't like about being at home. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to be away from home. So, so yeah, there's a lot to explore there, I think. Yes, I guess yeah. you could almost reinvent yourself, couldn't you, if you're living yeah. in a new community? Yeah, and, yeah, and I imagine, well, I mean, you hear a lot of dodgy things, don't you? There's people who do do that. Um, yeah. But, yeah.
Well, today our topic is busting the myths of digital publishing. Um, and I know you've published, you're published by Bookature and you've got mm -hmm. six books out since 2019. Yeah. Um, and um, I know they've had an amazing reputation. And obviously I announced the other day that I have my two books coming out with them next year. So it's yeah. great to have you on to bust the myths. This would be really interesting <laughs> for me. Um, congratulations as well on that. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So um, the first myth that I wanted to talk about, and this is quite a big one, and one that I hear quite a lot in like the writing groups and everything, is um, digital publishers um, will want three books a year. So is that true? Um, and how many books do you generally deliver a year? That's not true, I would say, <laughs> starting. So um, my first book, for, this is just an example, but my first book for Bookature was out in 2019, but I signed the contract in 2017. So you can kind of see how long they gave me. And that was because at the time I was pregnant and I'm always very ill with hyperemesis when I'm pregnant. I've only been pregnant twice, but both times oh. very ill. Um, so I couldn't, I just couldn't deliver. It was not possible. Um, so they were so flexible from the very beginning with that schedule, even with my first couple of books were delivered, you know, 18 months after I got the contract. So, and then since then, I um, have done one about every nine months, I think. Um, and the schedule has always been determined by me working with the editor. There's never been a point where I've felt that I can't say, actually, I need a bit longer, or I, I haven't felt any pressure from their side to do it faster than that, I must say. I, I mean, maybe if you wanted to only write one every two years, that might be a bit different. Mm. Um, but certainly for me, every nine months is fine. Um, I think people, some people do one a year. Um, so you certainly don't have to do three a year. And some people, but some people do do three a year and do it amazingly well. And I'm totally in awe of them. Yeah. Um, but I think I would find that really very difficult for me. Um, they have an enormous amount of flexibility and understanding of people's lives, people's schedules. Um, and it, it's an open conversation to have with them. Um, they do like you to publish regularly, I would say especially for the first contract to have the two books reasonably close together. I mean, for mine, for example, I delayed the publication. So my first two books were published three months apart, but obviously I'd had the 18 month lead in. Yeah. So they weren't three months apart at all. Yeah, of course. It just looked like yeah. that. So there's loads of things I can do um, to make it work for you. Is that myth sort of is staying around because you see two books come out really quickly and you should assume someone's written them like back to back so quickly and actually they arrange the publication dates like that, um, which is quite clever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it's 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 based on the individual author as well. And it's a conversation, isn't it? And some authors can write two to three books a year. I personally would probably go insane if I had to write three books <laughs> a year. <laughs> Writing one is just practically kills me. But anyway. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but that's really interesting on the time frame. Um, and another sort of digital publishing myth is that, which is you can kind of understand because of it's digital, um, is that um, digital publishers are only really focused, all their focus is on ebooks. Um, now, I don't know what you think about that. Is that actually true? Do, do you ever get print copies? Can you sort of talk us through how it how it works? Yeah. Um, so I would say I think it's true that their primary focus in terms of generating revenue and money for their authors is certainly ebooks. Mm -hmm. That does not mean, and it's f certainly when you're first starting out, that does not mean at all that they exclude everything else. So you always have paperbacks, you always have audiobooks. Um, so paperbacks, I mean, I've sold thousands of paperbacks as well, but the marketing is less focused on paperbacks. So you will always get a paperback. So you'll, you'll always have it. Whether or not it will be in the shops is, is a different question. They don't automatically go into the shops. Um, some of the bigger authors have had books. Um, I mean, like Angela Marsons, for example, will have hers all over the place. Yeah. Um, but some other other people will have got print deals because they have, Booker have a relationship. I think it's called Grand Central Union Publisher. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, but some people will then get a deal through Bookature with them that will do the print copies. Um, some people have print copies going into the works. And also as an individual, so me as an individual, um, when I was living in Ealing, um, I went into a bookshop and did sign copies there and they ordered in the books. So 
you always have the ability as well to go in yourself and build up a relationship with a bookshop. So it certainly doesn't stop you having your books in bookshops. The other thing I would say for me personally, my Polish editions are in bookshops, bizarrely. <laughs> um, so, so there is the foreign rights element. Um, and my Polish one's actually in airport bookshops, which is really quite Woo, congratulations. good. Yeah, for, for me, that's a big thing. Right? So, so it does happen reasonably regularly it can happen but it's certainly not promised no, I mean I don't actually think that's that different from traditional publishing no. because there's no absolutely no guarantees that you're where you're going to see your book and it's always interesting to hear the other side as well um because obviously I've only published with Booker and I've been really happy I, I don't really I mean from listening to this podcast I know a lot more <laughs> but um yeah I don't always know what it, exactly it's like to experience traditional publishing I think I think Lauren's right I think that now um, you know, maybe historically traditional publishing, you always would guarantee bookshops a bit more. I don't know. But certainly now um, it's it's a lot more difficult, I think, to get. Um, well, because everybody's cutting back and the supermarket shelf space particularly is getting, you know, ever, ever narrower, I think, for books. So, yeah, it's, it is tricky. Um, and how do things work in terms of marketing, Ruth? Um, I know that in traditional publishing, we don't really tend to know much about what goes on behind the scenes in terms of um, what the marketing team are doing to push our book. Sometimes we do, but it's not, you know, we don't hear lots about it. Is that is that different in terms of digital yeah. publishing? Is it more transparent? Yeah, I mean, it's very, oh, certainly with Bookature, I don't, haven't worked with any others, but yeah, we know everything that they're doing. We have sent an email with exactly um, what they're doing. So it's usually Facebook and Amazon ads, um, and then sometimes BookBub, and then all the social media blog tours, things like that. So all the um, marketing is online. So there's no nothing that's offline, unless I guess if you organise it yourself, you could do. You know, people okay. who have articles about their newspapers, that kind of thing. Bookature are targeting digital sales, so they're targeting those readers. So they focus very much um, on those channels to reach those readers. Um, okay. And I yeah. think it does depend. I mean, my my publishers usually do let me know what what they're doing um, for marketing. I know what you know when they're running ads on Amazon and Facebook, and um, when there's book bubs and Kindle promotions and things. They are quite good. I think it just depends on on the publisher. I know some traditional publishers may not be as transparent as, as, as what's what they're, what they're doing, but I think it's probably more likely, as you say, that digital publishers are because that's, you know, they're digital. So obviously all their all their marketing and promotion will be online, won't it? So, yeah, I, I actually think it possibly depends a lot on the author as well and how much they're pushing that information. Um, when, when it comes to traditional publishing I think if you don't ask you don't necessarily get told yeah. on publicity as well they do also send us around like opportunities to write articles um for what it's usually for websites I can't remember the names of any of them now but I, I did do it at the beginning um you know 10 things you might want to know about my book or 10 things you might want to know about me those kind of articles so there are those opportunities as well but you don't have, have to, to take to them. them yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and I think another one of the myths that we hear um, about digital um, books are that they aren't as good um, mm -hmm. as traditionally published books. Um, I, d I don't agree with that, actually, but um, but but it is definitely one of the things that, that you hear. So um, I just wondered if you could talk us through the process of how you work with your publisher kind of from start to finish. And how, yeah, how does that work? Now I've done a few contracts. It's usually... Um... At the contracting stage, I'll send off a synopsis that we will then discuss. The, I always make sure that it's kind of in line with the brand and with my own brand. So I don't send off like sci-fi or something like that. Um, I, I think, I think traditional story. publishers would find that very difficult as well, actually. So yeah, yeah. No difference I can imagine yeah. most publishers would. So um, sending something very much on brand, we would discuss the idea, revise it. A couple of times and then for the second idea of a contract it can be a bit more vague um, and then go to the contract um I'm very bad at sticking to the synopsis I write <laughs> to be honest they're kind of there but, but yeah as a bit of a guide um so then I go away and write the first draft um for a couple of months or two or three months depending on what I'm doing elsewhere in my life um then um, goes to my editor, have about two weeks. I don't think she takes the structural edits, get the structural edits. Um, then it's 
sometimes there's a second structural edit after I've edited after I'd reworks it all. Uh, then line edits, copy edits, proofread, final file. So I think it's like six rounds of edits, something like that. So it's quite a long yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah, that's very similar. I think very similar. It just maybe a slightly speeded up timeline. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of work goes into it from a lot of people, um, really. Um, and yeah, definitely quite fast work, but but it goes through a lot of different pairs of eyes. Um, and that's always quite reassuring for me because you know how it is, you could write one line that would offend someone, but you wouldn't necessarily pick it up. But if it goes through enough people, you hope that someone else will catch those kind of things yeah. for you. Yeah, and I guess it's, yeah. it seems quicker because it's the focus is on producing the books digitally rather than, you know, huge, big print runs. Um, yeah. so, but it sounds like the editorial process is just as thorough and, and, mm, and very, yeah, sim- that, very, yeah. very similar. Yeah. Mm. Another thing we hear a lot, which is it isn't really a myth, I don't think, because it happens, you know, that um, that digital publishers don't tend to give advances. Although I think one one or two may. I think is it is it Embla? Are they an uh, imprint of Bonnie? Are they they do I've heard they do, yeah. Yeah. Um don't know Amazon do as well, don't they? I think uh, Amazon, Amazon do, do. Yeah. 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 On the whole, I think quite a few um digital publishers don't pay an yeah. advance. Um how how does that sort of work? I mean, I know Bookature don't, um, but it, the there is an upside to not being paid an advance. For me, the fact that I earn the money from the royalties works a lot, a lot better. Um, so we earn forty five percent of the royalties, mm-hmm. um, which I think is quite a bit higher than in traditional. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I think more than makes up for not having the advance. I mean, it's meant that I can write full time, that I have a good income from it. So I, I personally think it's better. I wouldn't choose something different. And I think another difference is because Bookature published books so fast, it's not quite like it would be with traditional where you'd be waiting too long to get the royalties. You wouldn't be waiting two years and then get the royalties. You'd be getting them pretty soon. So so for me, for me, it's good. I can understand some people would, would prefer an advance. Um, but, mm. but for me, I definitely wouldn't choose that. Unless it was huge. I mean, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm ruling it out entirely. <laughs> If someone wants to offer I mean, a huge I, advance, then that's see, totally even with the big advances. Like, and I didn't know this when I first started in property and I got my first contract. I was like, oh, this is the money that I'm going to be given when I sign. And actually, it isn't. They break it into really mm. teeny tiny little chunks and spread it out like across all the publishing and everything. So it's not actually as exciting as you first think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think the idea of getting quarterly payments, which I think is what you get, is yeah. it? Um, I think that sounds quite nice, isn't it? Just to know you've got that chunk coming in every quarter. Exactly. Yeah. And with um, with many um, traditional publishers, we we get royalty statements once or maybe twice a year. Um, but I think um, authors, some authors are sort of they're kind of traditionally published authors may feel in the dark a little bit about their sales figures because you know around publication and the weeks you know following publication, you get given those regularly, but then you don't tend to be updated unless you specifically ask. I mean, obviously you, you you can you can have those figures if you if you want them. And it depends some publishers, my American publisher, you know, you can go online on, on a portal and find out how many you've sold if you can if you can remember what your sign on is and how, how to navigate the system. <laughs> But um, you know, do do you find that um, your do do you think it's more transparent with 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 digital publishers? Are you kept yeah. more you know up to appraised of what your your sales figures yeah. are? So certainly the royalty statements. If we start there, they're very very detailed. So split out um, by platform, by country, by month. So you, you know, in a really granular level of detail, exactly how much you've sold, exactly how much money has come from each market. And then the data, we get the data six weeks, every week for six weeks after publication, like detail, the detailed breakdown. Um, and then from then on, I think I get it every month. You can ask for it more often if you want. Basically, if you have a question, you just ask them and they will usually send you what you want. I mean, I'm someone who, I used to work in strategy, so I love all the data. So I think I'm one of those people who's always emailing, asking for data and being a bit annoying, to be honest. But they always <laughs> give it to me. Um so so yeah it, it's there if you want it they're, they're very transparent they're not trying to hide anything or mass, massage the figures or make you feel better well I mean they do want you to feel good 
you know they're not trying to make it sound better than it is or anything like that they're just giving you exactly what what you ask for and, and I think the... that's nice to have it on as you say on that granular level and to look at different countries and yeah that that's that must be very very um yeah useful. I mean we get that when it gets for royalty statements so it's always like a few months out of date we don't get that on a weekly basis I mean I think (laughs) that would be a bit crazy I would love it on a weekly basis (laughs) I think I might not have a contract anymore if I ask for all of this and royalty Um, statements are so difficult to read aren't they I find them really confusing I'm not a figures person at all so I'm like what does this mean what does that mean (laughs) I always like to know how my book is doing against previous books so I like them to tell me well how was my previous book at exactly this time in the cycle and How's this one performing against it? So they they can produce that as well, yeah. So um, one of the myths um, that actually put me off for quite a while um, mm. is um, that we're supposed to promote our books on social media like constantly. Um, I think I've, I think I had it in my head. It was like three times a day we're supposed to post. Mm. Um, and um, I was very very short actually to know that's not true. <laughs> but I did wonder if you could talk us through like what the expectations are from a social media perspective for um, digital publishing. Well, I think certainly for Bookature, there's no expectation at all. You can do as little or as much as you want. Some people don't have a social media presence um, at all. Um, and some people tweet all the time. I, um, but you, you don't have to. Yeah, you basically, you can choose what platforms you're on. You can choose not to be on any. You can choose to be on Twitter and, and tweet a lot or, or not. I haven't done very much recently, actually, on social media, and I should do more. Um, but I've tended to, to just tweet about my books. I, exactly the opposite of all the marketing advice, actually. <laughs> um, to engage your readers in all of that. Apart from I mean, I, there are people, obviously, who do it really well um, and are very engaged. I, I mean, I feel I'm quite a private person. and I, I don't necessarily want to engage on that level in a public forum. Uh, and that's totally up to me. No one's ever said to me, why aren't you doing more? Um, it's really nice. I think a lot of Bookature authors will promote each other. So, you know, they retweet you and they create a real buzz. So, so that kind of sense of community is very helpful. Um, and it, it's it's there if you want it, but you absolutely don't have to do anything, I would say. That's good um, because if you feel obliged to do something, and also if you're not a natural, as you say, if you don't feel like sharing things privately then you shouldn't have to you know I think I think it would come across false if you did that you have you have to feel happy about being on social media I think and yeah and I think you can tell the people who enjoy it as well from the kind of things they tweet about and the kind of engagements they have yeah um I mean I always will reply obviously if someone sends me an email saying they love my book or I mean that's amazing I love getting those emails I mean, I'm not saying you know I like that element of it and the tweets and the, the Facebook messages like those kind of things and I think I think from a personal point of view it's always important to engage when people contact you directly about, yeah. about your book yeah interesting and do you think um particularly with the current cost of living crisis um and um some of the issues the larger retailers um have been having with stock i think waterstones have been recently um do you think there's going to be more of a move to digital kind of longer term do you think this is the way that books are gonna end up going Hmm. i really don't know um because i feel like the pandemic provided quite a good opportunity for that and obviously digital sales did go up quite a lot whether there's room how much room that to grow further I don't really know I mean I guess it's if it's the substitute product isn't it for something else so if people stop buying paperbacks and choose to buy ebooks because of the cost um or if they maybe stop their Netflix subscription and choose to read instead so, yeah, I, I kind of feel slightly that there are people who will always want paperbacks, like whether from a library or from a charity shop or um, and who won't ever substitute across to ebooks. And then there's probably people who always read ebooks and never read paperbacks. Yeah. And there's people in the middle and, and there might be some substitution there. But I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'm hopeful that it is. <laughs> everyone's going <laughs> to move to ebooks. I don't know how you guys feel about the price point of ebooks. At the moment, I feel it, it's you quite want to cry. low. <laughs> Very low. It's just low. Yes. Yeah. Considering yeah. everything else has gone up. Yeah. 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 That, exactly. That's the thing, isn't that's it? Yeah. Everything yeah. else has gone up, but not books. Yeah. 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 That's um, where the crunch yeah. And it is, it's, it's mad the... when you look at, I think, things, you know, somebody, I think someone said on Twitter the other day, you know, that they'd paid 
I think four pounds fifty for a birthday card for you know a nephew or something like that. But you know people are still think oh ninety nine p for a book and that does make you feel a bit like mm. yeah you know, it's devalues the product I think um, which and I think that is it, are they priced the same abroad Ruth do you know because I think I mean definitely paperbacks um, and hardbacks abroad are far higher than cost than they are in the UK. Yeah, I think everything everything is higher. Um, I'm trying to think the ebooks. I think mine are usually three ninety nine in the states, and like one ninety nine in the yeah, UK. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. One ninety nine is the drop price point in America. One dollar ninety nine. Yeah, as as I know. I've, yeah. I've never seen it go lower. Mm. Yeah, uh, and I think Europe. I actually can't remember what it goes down to in Europe. I don't think they do so many price promotions in Europe, to be honest. Um, okay, yeah. The UK, US and Australia. Um, but but it's still it's still low, isn't it? Um, yeah. And, you know, over the last 10 years, it hasn't gone up. And I think everything else has. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, then um, but I don't think that's going to change. I, whether, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much substitution there'd be. Um, because at the moment, I think because books are often 99p, people do buy a lot that they never read. Mm, so yes, it's a sort of, I mean, <laughs> worryingly, hopefully it's not the substitution is that people go and read things that are already on their Kindle rather than buying yeah. something yeah. new. Yeah. I think there's a real mindset in this country for that to wait for that price point if you're sort of a savvy reader um mm. like and I do it as well so even though I know it's much better for the author to buy the book at like 4.99 I'm always like oh yeah but next month that's going to be 99p like why do I think like that I hate myself for doing it and then I, when when I realize it I'm like no I'm buying it now for 4.99 yeah. <laughs> it's just that mindset isn't it um yeah. you, you know we all do it as well and we and then you know you can see where it comes from yeah, I think the difference is we do do it, but we also are prepared to pay. If if a book comes yeah. out by an author and it's seven ninety nine, and we want to read it, I mean, I, I will buy it, and I yeah. will read, I will read paperbacks, I will read ebooks, I will listen to books on Audible. I'll, yeah, I'll sometimes yeah. buy a couple of formats of the same book. Yeah, so me yeah. too. Yeah, I think you know it, it swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Really. Yeah. Um, so my next question, Ruth, isn't about busting the myths. Um, it's what advice would you give to someone considering either starting their career in digital publishing or moving from traditional publishing to um, to digital? Well, I think as with any publishing experience, I would always research the publisher. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bookature, obviously one I can highly recommend. <laughs> um, but, but there's a range out there and people have a range of experiences. So always check what books they've published, how well they've done, how many Amazon reviews, all of that kind of thing um, to check that they're right for you, check that they're publishing the kind of thing you want to write as well so that you don't feel, you know, if it's very genre spe specific, is that what you want to write? Because I guess that's one thing that I'd say about Bookature and probably other digital publishers that I'm not entirely sure is that it's, it is unapologetically commercial. So if you want to write something pure literary, then it's not going to be a good fit. Yeah. So, I, so I think people should always check the fit mm. of the publisher, regardless of whether it's um, digital or traditional. Yeah. And moving from traditional to digital, I mean, uh, Lauren, you're probably better equipped to, to talk about it, but I, I feel like I can't, I don't know what any negative differences would be except the um, expectation management of like the advance, not having the advance necessarily, depending on the publisher and also not assuming your books will be in bookshops. So it's, it's kind of about expectations. I think I, I would have thought the process is not going to be too different. Um, no, I haven't yeah. found it any different, actually. I mean, the, the biggest difference to me is I've had to send my Christmas chocolates to more than one publisher now. <laughs> it's really, you know, <laughs> broken the bank, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. um, and our final question is about what are you reading at the moment, Ruth? Have you got anything you'd like to recommend to us? Yeah, so um, just yesterday, actually, I finished um, The Seven Ages of Death by Richard yes. Shepherd. Yeah. Have you read it? Um, yes. And I saw him talk at Ooh. Play Tales with you, Leslie. And he yes. was so engaging. I was yeah. such a fascinating. fascinating man. Yeah. So he reads the audiobook himself. And he does have a really amazing kind of lilt to his voice, doesn't he? Yeah. Um and, he, and the way he comes across is very compassionate and very um em empathic with the people yeah. saying, 
although it's about death, the book is quite soft somehow mm-hmm. and quite reassuring. Um, and it's just so interesting. Yeah. I mean, both his books have been really interesting. Um, and um, I'm trying to try to explain what it's about. It's just about um, how people die at different ages, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, no, it, um, it was really fascinating. Course. And he also does tours around the UK as well and yeah. just does talks. Uh, and they're supposed yeah. to be really good. I, I would like to go to one, actually. I just don't like to leave No, house. I want to go to one. Yeah. Um, so I yeah recently finished that, and then earlier this year I read um, a book called The Passenger by Ulrich Alexander Bolshevik, Bol- 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 okay. um, which is an old one. So he wrote it during no just after the war during the war I can't remember, but it's basically about him not him but about the character fleeing from the Nazis, but okay. he's just constantly on a train, so he goes from one train to another train to another train. And the suspense in it is just so well written. Oh, I'm gonna I mean, with all the backdrop of, of the, you know, the history, you could get lost in that, but you really get lost in the actual suspense of who he's going to talk to, where his train journey is going, what he's going to do when he gets there. And that sense of just the doom, it, it's, it's so good and so well written. And the character is really human in the way he behaves towards other people. So he's by no means a hero. He's just trying to... <laughs> Get out yeah. himself and protect yeah. himself. I, I just found it. It was so well written and so interesting. Um, That's a brilliant recommendation. Thank you. I've just written it down. I can't wait to get that one. I love, I love a good book like that. What about you, Nikki? What have you been reading? Um, well, I have been lucky enough to get a very early sneak preview of the next LC North book, um, which I know won't be out for quite a while um it's not obviously the ugly truth which is out um next year um but um yeah so I was lucky enough to read that and I loved it um I really loved it um so yes really really looking forward to that uh, kind of progress um and then I've also read um this uh which is called Dirty Laundry by um Disha Bose um yeah or Disha Bossi. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name. Um, but um yeah, it's brilliant. It's um it's a bit kind of desperate housewives, I guess, set in Ireland, but it's quite dark and it's about three women in um different very broken marriages for different reasons um and I loved it she writes absolutely beautifully and um really really good story and yeah I, I totally recommend it I think it's is out it proof or is it out yeah it's a proof it's out in March 23 oh, okay. so um yeah yeah very good very good so yeah and what about you Leslie what have you been reading well because I've been writing a lot I've a lot been writing, reading yeah. short stories and I've gone back to one of my oh, favorites oh, Ruth yeah. Rendell um short stories this, this is this anthology is called Bloodlines um yeah I mean I love Ruth Rendell I sort of grew up reading yeah. Inspector Wexford Mysteries and all the psychological thrillers she wrote under the um name Barbara Vine yeah uh, and I really I really want to get back into writing I do like writing short stories I haven't written any for a while and uh, Lauren and I were talking about this recently weren't we yeah. and and you know you could do you could do far, a lot worse than reading um some of Ruth Rendell's because you know just that capturing a moment and the, the suspense yeah. and the the characterization that she manages to sort of um convey in just a few short pages is is quite something okay um so I would thoroughly recommend that and I've also been sent um the beach party by Nikki Smith um <laughs> it's coming out in summer so I, I got that at the weekend so that's uh, as soon as I finish my draft I cannot wait to dive in <laughs> to the beach party I absolutely can't can't so that's that's really yeah really what I'm looking I, forward I, to. I was just laughing when you said about the short stories Leslie because I had to write a short story last week and I think I spent more time talking to Nikki and my friend Laura about the this short story they must have read about four different versions of it then I think I've done about like an entire book I, I I feel like I could have written a book in the time it took me to do the short story I still think they're going to come back and say actually this is not what we want so yeah never again I think um <laughs> I just finished last night um, Running and Jumping by um, Stephen Keady, um, which I think I talked about the fact I was reading it last time. And it's so good. I It's about a long jumper who um, is trying to like push himself to be the best he can be. 
but it's just got so much in it about determination and pushing yourself and I think that any author will certainly identify with the character and that desire to succeed and you know getting up every day even when you've hurting and you've been knocked down to keep going so I, I really enjoyed it I'm looking forward to um give put my review on Amazon actually for that um and then I just started in the blink of an eye by um Joe Callahan who I'm hoping we can get on the show actually next series um and I'm already just loving it. I only started it last night but it's brilliant and it's about a detective um and how she works with an artificial intelligence detective as well. So have you read it, Nikki? It's really good. It's yeah, really, so it's really, really good. Yeah. And I've it's... got my copy just down there. Yeah. I can't wait to read that as well. Yeah, yeah. so, so good. They are my books. I've heard really good things about that. Really, um, and yeah. I just also should mention that Nikki and I actually swapped books last a couple of weeks ago. So she read my 2024 book and I read hers and it was absolutely brilliant. So uh, that was a really exciting thing to be able to do as well. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, I'm afraid we've, we've really sort of running out of time now, aren't we? But um, we've really enjoyed having you on to our Christmas special, Ruth. And oh, thank you, you for inviting me. No, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And you've really helped us bust some of those myths about <laughs> digital publishing and given our viewers and our listeners a much more rounded um, view of, the, of, of, of what it entails. And so that's that's really, really, it's been great having you on. And your book, Ruth's book, The, the Nanny, is out now, everybody, and we thoroughly recommend it. All three of us thoroughly recommend it. So do check that out. Well, thank and, you. And uh, you, you will not regret it. <laughs> Um, and yes, it has been so lovely, Ruth. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to be taking a break for Christmas now, but we'll be back in January for series eight. Um, can you believe that? Mm -hmm. um, we have another fantastic mini sewed expert for you. And that's going to be, and I feel bad because I meant to just message her and say, is it okay? And I forgot, but I'm pretty sure she agreed. <laughs> if she didn't, she's in trouble. Um, we've got social media expert, Zoe Lee, who's going to be telling us all the do's and don'ts of social media for authors. Um, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Reels, everything that we all don't want to know about but really need to. Um, so that's going to be really fascinating. And of course, we'll be chatting to some fantastic guests as well. Do get in touch across any of our social media channels if you have any topics you'd like us to cover. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, then please rate and review on whatever platform you are listening on so that others can find it. Yes, and so for now, um, it's goodbye and a very happy Christmas um, from Ruth Heald. Bye, bye, happy Christmas. <laughs> and uh, bye from Lauren North. Bye. And Leslie Cara. Bye-bye, happy Christmas, everyone. Bye-bye and bye-bye from me. See you in 2024, 2023 even, yes. Oh, yes, 2023. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't skip it. <laughs> a year ahead of myself, I'm a year ahead, yes. <laughs> Bye.